Excellent. This is an Inside Jerry's Brain call on Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019, our second call of the day, actually. Uh, this one's about CEOs and trust. It's obviously a broad topic, um, motivated by an Axios uh, segment. They, they have a really nice series of newsletters now in some of the, the daily news, newsletter business uh, by, being, by encouraging what they call smart brevity, which means they, they, they have an opinion, they express it crisply and shortly, and there you go. And uh, one of those came out about, you know, CEOs are being um, pressured to find purpose, to, do, to fix things in the world, to solve social problems, to find meaning, a whole series of things like that. Uh, and I thought that is an awesome topic, so I figured we would um, dive in. And the, the one thing that's happened recently that seemed like an interesting place to start was the Gillette uh, ad. Uh, and let me phrase it properly. The, the best men can be, which is uh, different from the best men can get, which is what their old tagline was. Mr. Nelson, nice to see you. You are muted, but that may be intentional. Um, we are just beginning our journey into the topic, so your timing is perfect. Glad to be here. Hi, Judy. Hi, Judy. And here comes Ken, and I'm going to share, I'll share the screen where I was just looking. There we go. Um, so I was just saying that our, our topic here is CEOs and trust, or leadership and trust, or uh, why can't companies fix some of the problems that they break? And uh, I thought an interesting place to start was this uh, Gillette ad that ran very recently, which is part of their new campaign, The Best Men Can Be, uh, which in their ad includes a little nod toward uh, the sexism they engaged in before with their old tagline, The Best a Man Can Get, where they had these nice ads with attractive woman looking at man shaving self, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera uh, you know not necessarily helping uh, diffuse toxic masculinity. But I'm wondering, you know, what each of us thinks is, is Gillette's effort genuine, functional, worthwhile? Like just, just, just looking at what Gillette is trying to do here. Is it credible? What's, what's your take? Whoever wants to go first. My reaction is it's thin. <laughs> thin? <laughs> really depends, uh, meaning, razor thin. Meaning what else is there? Or? What kind of thin do you, do you mean? It feels superficial. Cosmetic rather than substantive. Mm -hmm. That's just a left elbow reaction. Sure, I sure. I watch the ad clip, so I can't comment on the artistry of that. Oh, but okay. So have you read a story about it, or what's, what's the, the level to which you followed it? Well, I, I just kind of read a little bit about it, and... I mean, first of all, I'm not someone who really likes, we've had this tagline before and we're going to change one word and it's going to change how we're perceived. Right. Because that's sort of disproportionate just in a time-weighted factor, which caused me to think that this was probably a quick fix. <laughs> but, but I questioned whether there was really uh -huh. substantive attitudinal change behind it. Jerry, this is Mike. Uh, I think actually it may be better to look at the Nike ad and the Kupernik campaign and because that's played itself out quite a bit. And that that's a similar opportunity for Nike to put itself on the right way of right side of a really big issue and to generate a lot of controversy and to get people talking about them. And at the end of the day, they generated a lot of a lot of sales. There were people writing in and, and, you know, sending back their Nikes or filming YouTube videos with them burning their Nike shoes in a bonfire. But right. they, particularly overseas, apparently, it just was an incredible way to increase visibility at the same time saying, you know, we support equality. By the way, I, I've been joined with my 21-year-old daughter who's going to provide a, a viewpoint. Where is he? The other Hello. Side. Yay, excellent. The new graduate, actually. She graduated. Seriously? In yeah. So, how, did, how did they let you out? I <laughs> uh, took a few, I took a summer class and worked my butt off for three and a half years. What's your field of well, study? Huh? What is your field of study? Uh, neuroscience with minors in chemistry and leadership. 
Fantastic. Thank you. That's and she was wonderful. inspired by Jerry many years ago. So <laughs> she's been in my brain a long time. <laughs> I feel so special. <laughs> you are brain famous. That and four dollars will get you a coffee at Starbucks. Wow. Oh my gosh. Exactly. Um, so let's let's pick up where we were. Uh, Ken or Bill, any thoughts on? Uh, and, and actually, then back to you, Lizzie, if you want, on the campaign on either Gillette's campaign or Nike's Kaepernick campaign or anything like that. I do have a couple thoughts. Um, one, I, I I would like to just acknowledge, and I've had this conversation in the last few days with people because I've been following what's some of the reaction on Facebook. I do think there's good people inside the organization trying to do good things. And they're also operating inside an ecosystem where they're very constrained, you know, and so there's a lot of compromises that get made. So I want to acknowledge that this probably had a genuine heart in it somewhere that got diluted as the advertising went on. And, you know, I look at um, TV2 in Denmark has a really fantastic commercial called All That We Share where um, they bring together a number of people, you know, the, the people who have dwelt in the cities their whole lives, people from the countryside, people who've never seen chickens before. The, uh, you know, there's the people who are Denmark natives, people who have been recently immigrated. And the guys are standing, they're all in squares, and they're like, you know, and they start asking questions like, who were the class clowns, you know, and everybody kind of goes up, and who were the bullies, and who got bullied? And they ask them these series of questions that if you've ever been involved in facilitation, often this is like a trust thing where you name things, people walk across the room, you know. And at the end, you see people coming together. And I think there was real genuine heart in that of we want to try and help people see that the media can reflect the better parts of the country. And I think Gillette would like to, to reflect the better parts of masculinity after a long time of, of being on the toxic side. So I really want to acknowledge that. And then on the other side is that that sense of, it's been, as Judy said, it's thin, razor thin, I might add, you know, it's, it's been watered down. Um, it, it, it smacks of, of a, a kind of a patronizing to me, you know, like, okay, we can, let, let's do something here that will look, make us look good so that we can look good. And yeah, it'll generate controversy, but in advertising, any type of uh, attention is generally considered good. So that'll drive more sales. So I think there's, there's both, both elements are in there. There's probably some others as well that I may not be able to name off the top of my head, but um, I like to at least, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're trying, even though they're up against a lot of nasty stuff. That's my perspective on it. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me of, um, and I think you were, you were describing, there were a couple different projects like this where they got people who were very different from each other to do things together. In one of them, they had people stand in, in squares in a, in a large room they had people stand in rectangles according to their demographic, basically. They were, you know, the younger, the uh, people of color, women, et cetera. But then they said, if you are X, step forward, mm -hmm. right? And if you've, ever, if you've ever not known where your next meal was going to come from, step forward. And they'd go up, up against the wall and they'd look at each other and people would come out of each of the rectangles and go, go to the front of the room and then they'd take a portrait of those people. And then everybody'd step back and they'd ask another question. And the questions were quite, quite deep. Right, um, uh, so I think those are those are in really interesting efforts to do something. The funny thing about advertising, and I'm not I'm no fan of advertising, uh, is that it offers you almost no peek behind the, the the veneer of what the company's actually thinking, what's hap you know, what anybody did to get there. It's just it's just veneer, right? And so as much as they might actually tackle difficult issues and do something interesting. It's hard to get the credibility behind it, which is why I think thinking of it as a campaign, again, this, this sort of sucks, but so the, here's the, this is the, my, my, the link in my brain that this is the YouTube link to the ad on YouTube, <clears throat> but this is actually a website that they put up uh, around the best men can be. So if we go to the website, you'll see that there's, there's sort of more to it than just an ad campaign. And the interesting thing is that several people I've talked to, oh, actually it appears not to be happy coming up. Um, several people I've talked to, there we go, um, had negative opinions of the ad, but hadn't watched the ad. And you know, it's just an ad. It's like at most uh, a minute and a half, two minutes long, right? Um, but that's really interesting because it's not even the ad that reaches people, but the thought of the ad or the title of the ad or a mention of the ad. And so companies must be sort of freaking out because they're like, man, 
we do something where we think we're putting our neck on the, on the guillotine a little bit and we can't, you know, we can't get people to walk in the door and, and come have that conversation, which I think they'd be worried that way, but um, it seems like a, like a natural concern given kind of where things are and, and, uh, and what's up. Oh, good. April, join us. Do we know which ad company produced the ad and whether it's the normal one that Gillette has worked with or did they break new ground, hire somebody different? Do not know who did the campaign. Yeah. Uh, often when I find out those things, if it shows up somewhere, I, I add that to my brain. I'll, I'll sort of put the ad company, the ad agency above it. And in this case, I did not. I was thinking it would be fun to go out. If I'd had time, I would have gone and read the article in Advertising Age about the campaign. Exactly. It's fascinating to see how they think about these things and you know, the, the metrics they use to quantify success. So maybe I can do that while we sit here. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, and historically, Benetton, for example, um, was famous for its ads that were breaking taboos and uh, you know, pushing on race issues and priests kissing and a whole bunch of other things. They were sort of noted for um, cam campaigns that tried to, to push the, the boundaries. But at some point that sort of just became their signature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little bit like Madonna, who was doing exactly the same thing. Madonna was sort of like Benetton with a, with a, with a, ta with a song attached. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, Lizzie, how, how have you reacted to these things? I actually haven't seen this commercial. So I've been reading up. I'm not uh, very well versed in commercials as of late, but I would, I would be interested, maybe you can uh, clarify this for me, if, since you've seen the commercial, um, of how they're relating this um, social justice movement, this concept to their actual product. Because I tend to find that very interesting. Like um, the failure that was the Pepsi commercial with Kylie Jenner was that it not only, yeah, not only was it improperly um, using a very emotionally wrought uh, social movement, but it had nothing to do with Pepsi, it had nothing to do with their message. So that's, that to me would be um, very interesting to see the, how they're correlating their own message as a brand to this movement. Um, Cause that would, that would speak to me whether or not this is mainly for um, pro uh, selling product or if it was actually an attempt to bring up a bigger discussion because that's that's what I tend to see is a lot of like Nike I like they did it really well with uh, Kaepernick is that their their motto is just do it work hard be an all-or-nothing athlete and that's what Kaepernick was so that fit very well I think that's why it was such a success um, and why the Pepsi one failed so catastrophic catastrophically yeah it's really interesting also because Nike was um, Tiger Woods' sponsor <laughs> and was, was slow to release its grip on Tiger, right? Yeah. Despite Tiger's absolute shit show. Yeah. Um, and, and so they have to sort of tread carefully also because the world and the country appear to be split 50-50 or 30-30 or something. I mean, there's a yeah. middle that doesn't, doesn't care, but there's a bunch of people at each end who are pretty upset about things. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and when you do something that takes a stand, you're going to piss off the people who are at, at the other end of the dumbbell, which, yeah. which, which sucks, but that's, that's sort of where we are um, socially. Yeah. Actually, can I steal your headphones? And I, I want to watch this. Thing. So, um, Jerry, just a data point from Advertising Age. Um, the director of the spot is Kim Gehrig, who was selected via Procter & Gamble's partnership with Free the Bid. Uh, it's a program that Free launched in 2016 that aims to get more female directors on ads. And PG and E, uh, P and G, has been involved with the effort since last year. And they mentioned that some other similar ads have come out from Just for Men, from uh, Unilever's Axe, um, and from uh, from from Schick, the uh, the other razor company. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Back pocket. But anyway, it's really interesting. It Thanks is interesting that they, they did bring in a new director, a new team to do this ad. And it, I guess it shows, doesn't it? That's in the mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad that, you're, that we have a young woman on the program because I'm of a vintage that came through 
coincidentally entering the professional field right around the time of the Equal Opportunity Law. And it dramatically changed initial response from prospective employers, sorry. Apologies, I should have shut my phone off. But it's all right. How many people have watched the ad? I mean, I, I didn't have time to, so everybody else has, okay. And I, I guess I just think that, that the, the movement has come through to an extent, has had recidivism, is making a second surge in terms of gender issues. Um, and there's some additional, you know, it was more compliance initially and very Spartan. And you, you got benefits that the guys had already had because they'd been getting favoritism for decades. And now there's a different level playing field, but it's not exactly level. And there's some more authenticity at times, but it's still a very open question because of all the polarities that are going on in society right now and the points of view about appropriate roles. So I think coming at this multi-generationally would be interesting also. I think Jerry's topic for today is particularly good because there are a lot of CEOs over in Davos right now. And there's a lot of discussion about creating the right culture in the workplace. Uh, if you, I mean, this is, sounds like a plug, but there was a panel this morning, uh, very early East Coast time, on women in the new workplace. And uh, our co-founder, Michelle Zatlin, was on that panel. And all five panelists, or the moderator and the four panelists, were all really good and talking about you know, how important it is to, to ask the question, you know, where is the woman's perspective here? Why are there eight people in the room and seven of them are men? Um, and, but also just how do you structure the workplace so that uh, uh, your very best people will stay in your company, whether they're women or men? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really is, there's a lot of, if you look at the, the, the play, uh, look at the program this year, it, it just seems like a lot more cultural issues and a, and a lot less speculation about finance because I think everyone's giving up on projecting what the economic economy is going to do. So Lizzie just watched the video. You can ask her opinion now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're, you're, our, 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 you're our focus group, Lizzie. What oh do you think? Um, That's right. I, I stand by my old opinion uh, or my old thoughts, which I don't think they really, I think they're just taking a social stand as opposed to actually uh, relating it to a product. I would have been much more interested if they had um, incorporated this movement with the concept of male beauty and self-care standards. So there's a movement of um, toxic masculinity when it comes to male self-care uh, male, male self and shaving. I think that would have been far more flawless and far more interesting. Well, this just feels like a powerful film that you post to YouTube and don't make it a commercial. This makes no sense to me as a commercial. I think it's great, but it missed the mark. That, that's what I think in a lot of these cases, the companies are thinking, let's generate controversy or let's show we're on the right side of the issue. Mm -hmm. And the issue has very, very little or nothing to do with their business. So mm -hmm. the fact so, that there's uh, something doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, yeah. So to, so, so to bump the conversation maybe up a, a, a sphere, um, an orbit, let's say, um, for me, Gillette, um, the, the, the sort of the skeleton in Gillette's closet has to do with intellectual property over protection. And if you read the book Rembrandt's In the Attic, which is all about IP, you will learn that Gillette is a, a patent master. And they have patents on the multi-headed razor, et cetera, et cetera. But they also have patents on a camera they invented to film how the blade is going over your skin, et cetera, et cetera. And their masters are creating what's called a patent wall because patents expire after 17 years. So what you do is you modify some aspect of the patent and then you, and you patent that. So you basically keep patenting the thing and you lock out competition from being able to do pretty much anything. So part of the reason until the Dollar Shave Club, we've had more or less a monopoly in, in, in razors is thank you so much Gillette, right? Which is why PNG probably bought them. Um, so that, to, like, like I, I, I think toxic masculinity is a huge issue and I like that they took a bite out of it. But if they were to turn around and go, you know what, we've been kind of slime balls on the IP side and here's how. And I, I don't know that they did that illegally, but it, it's restraint of trade 
using whatever methods, you know, using lawyers. It's, I actually think of that as a form of dark innovation. I have a whole presentation I did a decade ago on dark innovation, which is we think of innovation as an unalloyed good, like, oh, innovations must be good. Heck no, there's a ton of brains and, and treasure being spent to protect, defend, defeat, uh, puncture, do whatever, and really smart people are you know, on that job. Um, so, so to me, Gillette kind of, okay, fine. I'm, I kind of like the ad more than most of you guys seem to. I haven't heard yet from Bill or, or April. Um, but, but, you know, there's plenty of skeletons to sort of bring out. And I think the conversation also is you're a CEO, you want to uh, find purpose and do something meaningful in the world. Which one of these battles do you actually pick? Yeah. Right. Cause some of these battles will put your company under. Yeah. You know, if, if, if Disney, if Disney incorporated uh, decides tomorrow it's going to stop trying to extend copyright every 20 years because the mouse is going to fall into the public domain its stock value will probably be cut in half tomorrow if they come out and confess to what the hell they did and what effects it's had on the world and what's going on. But they could. Yeah. <laughs> and my first real part-time job was at Disney in Anaheim in the park shooting, you know, hippos with a nickel-plated Smith & Wesson 38. Yeah. Well, Cap Cloudflare has d gone the other way. You know, we, we decided that we thought the patent system was being abused. And so we stood up and said, we're gonna go after these people who are suing companies because they have some vaguely written patent and they're over applying it. And we really gathered some other people behind us. We started crowdsourcing uh, uh, previous patents and you know, invalidating a lot of the patents that these patent trolls were using. And, and, and again, this is right core to the IT industry. And, it made sense for us to make a big deal about it. And as a result, a lot of people paid attention, even though we were a small company with only 400 people. And, and again, I think that's, that's when it makes sense for the CEO to stand up and say, we're going to do something. I mean, Starbucks had this example where they had uh, some very racist behavior by some of their staff in Philadelphia, I believe. And, you know, they took it head on and said, you know, we're going to take a day and we're going to close down our, our coffee shops for several hours and we're gonna make sure everybody gets uh, an, an understanding of why that was wrong and why it's not gonna happen again. Super mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, that was a crisis response, but it was also core to their mission to provide a friendly, comfortable community gathering point. Mm -hmm. Bill, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, as you know, from one of our previous um, conversations, I've been doing a lot of research on relationship issues, primarily couple issues, et cetera, which to a large extent these days is focusing around patriarchal psychology. In other words, the pathology, the, the real toxic, and you've got people like Terrence Real who are deeply embedded in that, trying to teach psychologists across the United States about that problem and how to deal with it. Because even in, in essence, what's, what the patriarchal psychology has done is basically demonized the feminine aspect of dealing with issues, emotional issues, etc., which he basically has found has demonized the, th the therapist because the therapist inevitably comes in and tries to, to get the guy to open up, to just be willing to listen to this idea that there's something emotional that's valuable in a, in a relationship, etc. I raise that because to me, this is a deep cultural long-term problem that isn't going away with one or two or three ads. And it's very interesting to sort of listen to Lindsay's approach as a young female, because she's really trying to express that which has been demonized. And I think that Gillette was probably sort of it, realizing that if it was going to get through to anybody, it's got to open the door on the man's side first before he's going to listen to a more sensitive approach to the product or the, the issue, etc. I mean, it, it's really so deep. There's a um, Dr. Gabor um, uh, Mate out of Vancouver. Gabor Mate. Right, who's written a lot on addiction therapy and everything, but his next book he's, he's been talking about is going to be called, called Toxic Culture. And it's all written, it's all going to be organized around this whole issue of, of how for ages we have 
really structured a, a, an enforcement of men being almost literally pathologically focused on production, in other words, making things happen, to the demise of any kind of feminine sensitivity to how it's affecting, whether it's the ecology or the family or their, their kids or healthcare. You know, I mean, it's, it's all about dominating things. And it's, it's really, I mean, I really, at one point, I came across some, some information about a study that was apparently done by the National Institute of Health back in 1970-71, where for some reason, somebody came up with the idea of testing, doing a worldwide analysis of the correlation between Western methods of childbirth you know, in other words, which is, if you stop and think of it, it's basically a male dominated, let me tell you how to do it, you know, woman, even though you've been doing it for a million years. But at the end right. of the day, they wanted to test, what did this have to do? And, and they, for, for some reason, focused specifically on violence in the society. In other words, the degree to which there's more Western form of, of, of childbirth and violence, and they found a direct correlation worldwide the more the Western method of, of childbirth is used, the more violence in the society. Now, I mention that because this is where, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get systemic about this whole relationship issue. Where is it coming from? You know, what, what's the core aspect that's, that's driving this? And I think the Gillette has put their finger on it from the point of view of those men, you know, standing there triumphantly demonstrating their manhood and, and, and not being open to listening to anything else. That, that, that's, that's so deep, it's going to take generations to, to, to dig it out and, and rebalance it. it it's, it's both an old and a recurring phenomenon, I think. Um, because my husband was a psychiatrist and he had a period of time when he was practicing rural community mental health on the Iron Range of Minnesota, which is rather like Appalachia in culture. Um, lots of people with very different perspectives. And he couldn't use normal approaches to dealing with domestic violence because the normative behavior in the culture validated domestic violence on the part of the man. Right. And so the woman's reaction to it was, well, I couldn't consider that. I mean, it just wouldn't work. And so it required a, a more creative approach to talking more about how the relationship worked than about specific behaviors and what you would accept or not accept or things like that. It's, it's just a single data point, but it was a community-based one that I thought was very interesting at the time. Yeah. If, if I could give a pitch for what I consider to be sort of like a, a fundamental shift that is coming from research of a, Dr. Sue Johnson, Mm -hmm. it's got something called emotionally focused therapy, EFT. It's not the same EFT as tapping. Mm -hmm. uh, it's her, her own sort of wording for this. But, but to me, the value of that is that, as you're sort of touching on, Judith, the, there's, there's an issue of how do you structure this? How do you restructure the conversation, the home, et cetera, as it relates to this product process? Because what she's basically divined is that this attachment theory that John Bowlby came up with back in the 70s really was something that could be applied to uh, the family environment, but it required almost a structural understanding of what's needed in the relationship. In other words, a commitment to what they call a secure base and the ability to have a safe haven which are sort of like conflicting things. In other words, the, the person is trying to be safe, but you also have to have an environment that's safe. And, and in essence, they get into the, the she gets into the, the, the way that you accomplish that. Uh, but my point there is that if the, the family environment is aware that they have to create a safe haven for both of them, within which they can sort of huddle together and organize these emotional issues in such a way that they they create a secure base. In other words, I can go out there and explore, which is basically the thing that Bowlby raised about kids. Kids basically come into the world with two sort of paradoxical challenges. One is to find safety. In other words, where am I going to get fed? 
or cared for, and the other is to explore. And the exploring basically gets hampered by not having a secure base. In other words, they can't feel comfortable. One thing that's fascinating to me is that we're deep into sort of, sorry, Bill. We're deep into human psychology right now, and we're sort of going down that path, which makes a ton of sense. And I'm realizing, oh, right. So psychology has been used in business for a really long time to do advertising. And Eddie Bernays is the guy who popularized Sigmund Freud for use in business to convince everybody using Freud's theories of the Oedipal complex and you, know, you, you name it <clears throat> um, to talk us into buying more shit. So, so it's not that business has been unaware of these principles or not touching them or not using them. They've just been using them basically to make us buy more crap. And in many cases to make us insecure and incomplete so that we would need to get more stuff to become complete, right? Um, what we need. Exactly. And, and, and to, to wean us off the notion that we are enough, that we are worthy, that we are all those kinds of things, because it, once you feel you have enough or are enough, you might stop buying a whole lot of stuff. And, and, and maybe I'm painting too dark a picture of, of sort of the traffickers of commerce, uh, Tom, am I going? Am I going too dark here, or um, you're darker than I, I experienced at 3M, which is a pretty big company. But I know 3M yeah, exactly. is not typical either in some ways, and that's why I ended up at that particular company and not several others where I interviewed, where what I viewed as a moderately progressive position would have been viewed as far left in their culture. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the notion, just to give just a little bit about 3M, I mean, the, the heritage is that you can't have creativity if you don't have people who are free to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes and investigate new ideas. Those are underpinnings of the corporate culture that are 100 years old now, but they get reinforced and passed on. So there's a lot more permission to be who you are. Having said that, there were very clearly stereotypes that I bumped into all the way through coming in as one of a dozen PhD equivalent women in the early 70s when there were 6,000 technical employees and there were 14 of us. <laughs> so it, it was a, a different mode, but there was some openness to changing over the years and it has made progress, but more slowly than I would have hoped. On a job front, by the way, I was interested in reading one factor that sort of mentioned that more and more of the jobs in the future are going to be what was characterized as nurturing requirement. In other words, like in the hospital industry, nursing and stuff like this, psychologists, etc. And that the challenge that they were finding in that particular area was that they couldn't get men to take the job. Mm -hmm. And so some of this re structuring, in other words, pulling the toxicity out of it, is in essence going to be driven by that need to get a job. You know, you got to learn this stuff, guys. <laughs> I, I think there's a piece, though, of, of what was at the very beginning of the call that I'm really interested in exploring, which is, is kind of this invitation or demand of action by senior executives to demonstrate a more complete leadership than the traditional business only business first for the best of the stockholder and the company and to engage in the question of larger issues. And I'd be interested, those of you who interface with a lot of different companies or have different experiences to share thoughts on the extent to which that happens. Are there circumstances that provoke the behavior in a positive way? Are there, I don't know, just how to frame that because I think that's where there is an opportunity where there's cohesive culture in an, a work setting to become part of a social movement that's consistent with the values of the organization. And I don't know if that's where you wanted this to go, Jerry, but it's a, it's a dimension of, of that question of expectations of CEOs and how they choose to respond. But it's more than just the CEO because it's really the boardroom and it's the sea level of the company that set the tone and either support or discourage behaviors of certain types. And all of the above, um, boardroom, CEO, 
and C-suite are underrepresented in women, people of color, pretty much everywhere across the board, except in a couple industries, uh, which may be stereotypically um, feminine. Um, Tom, I wanted to, to, to come mm -hmm. back to you for a second, just for your reflections on, on whether I'm overstating the, uh, the narrative there. Uh, I would reword some of the stuff you did on the advertising, but overall what I'm hearing from everybody is not overstated, but there's so many different ways to spin this. Just briefly, first on the advertising, uh, so, so many people get their sense of self-identity from their masculinity. And being a macho man is very much who they want to be and who they see themselves as and who they want to be and who their mates want them to be. So products that are marketed to them to reinforce that identity are not trying to change them, but simply trying to exploit an opportunity that's already there. You know, you have the, the larger, should a company be doing that or should they be trying to change that or trying to change masculinity? Those are all different conversations. The point is these people are trying to sell products and as they realize people want to be macho, you end up with pickup trucks getting bigger and bigger and bigger and all the advertising showing that this is how virile you will be if you drink this beer, et cetera. So I, I don't put it in. So it's perhaps somewhat, not so much immoral, but just simply amoral. Um, but then when it comes to the leadership, when the leadership, you're talking about how should a lead, leader behave in these situations. Uh, as you know, my company is called Macro Forces, so I start at the real high level. And this is where a book that I've, you, Jerry, I've brought up with you several times and others may have heard about it. Um, but it, there's this concept of economy has really overtaken almost every domain of thought now. We have this sense that the economy is what should be motivating every decision. That's why we decided it was a good idea to elect a businessman to be the head of a government. You know, governance is not business. These are very, very different. And so we've got this sort of poisoning of almost every other domain of thought by the business domain. And then when it comes to the motivations of the CEO, we do tend to breed the like he gets like, right? We, we promote those who tend to, we see as great people, and we look for people who look like us to be seen as great people. So you get these macho men in power, and they are going to be promoting other macho men. But I also look at uh, things such as Rhonda, Rhonda Ruhar's book, about financialization, makers and takers, where it talks about the financial incentives that once you've made it to a C-suite, you have often made it there because you're motivated by your own enrichment. And when you get there, your opportunities for your own enrichment are extreme. And so there's this, this system of rewards that we've set up that is, is really broken. And uh, that's why you get situations like when Apple decided to borrow money, even though they were cash rich, they borrowed extra billions of dollars to do a stock buyback because they could write off the interest they were paying on the money that they borrowed, which meant the ta taxpayers were really subsidizing the stock buyback. And when you do a stock buyback, the people who benefit the most are the large stockholders, which tend to be a lot of the people like the CEO and others that are high up in the company. So we have to not only look at personal incentives, right? How are, how are individuals psychologically motivated, but also look at the incentive structure in that, uh, that their company is bedded within. Thank you, Tom. I totally, I, I, I totally agree. Everyone see the amazing statistic released by Oxfam at Davos that 20 yes. people in the world have more wealth than the poorest 50% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. that was the Every year that number gets smaller. Two years yeah. ago, 41. Oxfam is, re is releasing this every year right before Davos, which I think is a great idea. You're tr they're trying to you know, take the conversation in that direction. And really, what is the conversation that needs to be had? It's, it's this idea that the economy has overtaken all other domains of, of human society. And the immorality of the haves and the have-nots, too. It's a very difficult conversation, but I, I find it somewhat ironic that Davos is the venue that they choose to bring that up in because that's where you really do have a lot of the riches of the rich. And you have the people who are heading up the large corporations that frankly are really re being, uh, they're set up to benefit the most from the system we already have. So they are the least incentivized people to try to change. And I, at Coca-Cola, I, I was working there for quite a while and I tried to help them understand that a corporation is a human invention, it's a tool, a technology. 
corporation can do what we've designed it to do. And what is a corporation is designed to do is to concentrate wealth. And you could spin it like, is it creating wealth or is it extracting wealth? But really what it is, is a tool that causes wealth to come together at one place for the benefit of the people at the company. And then once you've got the money there, then you have to decide how to allocate it. And that's where the allocation towards shareholders has gotten out of hand. Um, but it's not so much that the tools are bad, but how we are using these tools. Corporations are needed, but we can modify how the money they create is distributed and perhaps even cause the rules for what money they are allowed to extract. Um, wow. Is Coca-Cola doing the right thing when it's extracting, you know, 25 cents, 50 cents at a time, money from people who are so poor that to buy a Coca-Cola is something that can oftentimes be equivalent to, you know, half a day's wages. I like where we've gotten. We've got a sort of a whole bunch of things on the table. Um, I'm wondering if you were made CEO of some large enterprise tomorrow, what would any, any of us in the room do? Like, how do you, how do you tackle this? What, what do you do? Pre-existing company or our own? Uh, a pre-existing company. You can even pick one if you want. To, to me, I, I had posted the reference to that 15 commitments of conscious leadership. Mm -hmm. There's a very simple four step um, diagram in the book that in my mind it makes it possible to bring up all the issues that we've been talking about with a very simple focus on the fact that most leadership structure, most hierarchical structure is folks focused around victim mentality. It is 100% if there's a problem, who did it and who are we going to blame so that we can fix that person or that department. That's 100% victim mentality. And, and if you can get people to understand that that's not healthy, then they start looking, well, what else is? And you move closer and closer to that sense of relationship building and, and healing the, the sense of victimizing and blaming as opposed to reinforcing it. So that would be my start. And, and it's interesting that the group that's, that wrote that is getting some headway with some very large companies that are, that are picking up on this and realizing it. I, I would want to add on to that um, and say, I would probably agree in that I wouldn't want to pick a already successful company. I'd want to pick a failing company. Because like you said, I think one of the biggest issues is um, that the communication structure that is in, not just the victim blaming, but the overall communication structure in a lot of big companies is just truly failed. Um, in one of my uh, classes in my leadership minor, we discussed something called the LMX theory um, of leadership communication, which is it basically um, details how, how effective leadership or a form of effective leadership uh, communication is done within large companies. Um, and how there it's kind of like a pyramid out. Um, but I think one of the big issues is that there's, there's not, not as, not even that there isn't open communication, but there's not multiple branches of open communication. There's often just the CEO has one or two members and they have one or two, and then it vastly, it's a more of an exponential pyramid than equilateral, uh, well-balanced pyramid. So I would say, on top of just not blaming, but having that that decentralized or centralized, but far more open, transparent, and well balanced form of communication in, in, in a company would be highly effective because that's from what I've seen um, in my studies. One of the ultimate failures of any company is just the CEO or the head is so isolated that nothing can fully be determined or solved. Well, what's funny that? <clears throat> Go ahead. I just wanted to. Uh, Lydia, I don't know anything about this element, but I was wondering if it also spoke to communication that goes not just top down, but side, you know, horizontally and, and also allowing employees to communicate upwards. Yeah, it mentions that. Okay. Well, Lindsay, just know that in systems theory, it's definitely veering toward a, away from that hierarchical because it, the, the systems just won't support hierarchy yeah. it's too slow it's too wrong 
Some of the solutions are, uh, there was one company that limited each part of their business to no more than 150 people because of the fact that when you, apparently one person can basically manage relationships with roughly seven people within a corporation. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the multiplication of that allows people like the CEO to actually know everybody in the organization up until about 150 people. Yeah. So the minute that you go over that, you have to get into more of that hierarchical, restrictive, you know, you know, structured environment. So I think that the businesses are already learning, you know, in this internet age, that they can't survive with the traditional organi hierarchical organizational structure. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to starting with a with a bad company, though, Warren Buffett once said, whenever he's looking at companies, if he sees a, a company that's basically going downhill with bad management and everything, he stays away from it. Because usually when there's a fight between success, in other words, the marketplace and, and bad management, bad management always wins. Yeah, okay. Because they have a reason for it. In other words, they have a reason for structuring their control, their way of doing it. This is the way that we always did it. In other words, it's very difficult to get over that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so it's I'm more wishful thinking than I guess. <laughs> well, can I, can I bring up a case that we, uh, I, I, have you talked about the, the Google employees reaction to some of the recent decisions at Google? Uh, you haven't talked about it in other calls? Um, we haven't brought that up much, no. Because that's an amazing case study where management didn't anticipate how the employees would feel and how they might lose employees who reconsidered their view of the company they were working for based on one or two decisions. But I, I, I think that the, the opportunity of employees to use the technology to mobilize and really change um, policy at their company and to, and to make us think, it's powerful. Lizzie is I'm signing sure. off. Our, Bye. Our, 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 Thanks, our, Lizzie. Our, Bye, Lizzie. Just increased a bit here. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. Yeah, thank you. It was very educational. Yeah, Mike, on that idea of the, the Google employees, uh, I really like that because I think a lot of what's going on right now is that we just simply have to rebalance how the power structures in terms of different voices. You know, without unions, you don't have the workers having that much of a voice. One of the, um, one of the uniquenesses about Google is that most Google employees, if they were to leave today, could find a job almost immediately. So they have a little bit more freedom to be expressive of those views. I wish we could have an environment when, in most companies where the, the will of the working, the labor force could somehow be grouped together and held uh, in common uh, authority along with the senior leadership so that they can make joint decisions or at least have a bigger say into how decisions are made. And some of the 38 year olds could probably retire at this point. Right, right. That's part of the problem is that if you pay everybody reasonably well, given what the company's making, they, they can walk. They, they don't, they're not connected, you know, addicted to you anymore. Unless of course they're addicted to always needing more either competitively or, you know, personally. Um, but once, once they have some degree of financial autonomy, they're much less afraid of just stepping up and saying, Hey, this is not so cool. Yeah. So part of this, I mean, it feels it feels in some cases like we're sort of patching the current system because ironically for for America being such a great democracy, our school system and most of our corporations are as autocratic as pretty much anywhere. Like the schools are top down, companies are top down, what management says, you know, what's your KPI, stay in your lane, <clears throat> go crazy. And there's a couple of companies out there, and unfortunately, the way I the way I trip across them is that they are exceptions to the rule that are highly democratic, highly distributed, where there's high trust down to the fingertips and the workers. Uh, and these wind up becoming case studies. We tell the same stories over and over and over because they're sort of rare. Um, but your average company is incredibly autocratic. So I think a piece of this is tackling the ownership structures and the management structures and loosening them up in some way. And I, I, for, for big legacy companies that are used to the, uh, the autocratic and have hired you know, 90% staff that, that sort of expects that, is used to that, and has been doing that for multiple decades, super hard to change that. I'm not even sure I know of that many cultures that have shifted dramatically. I, mean, I think uh, Microsoft and IBM might be interesting uh, examples of cultures that have changed a lot. Judy, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, 
my experience at 3M, while there were levels of this involved, it was nothing like, say, when I interviewed at DuPont or Hercules or other big chemical companies, or even BASF, which is a more enlightened European, but old historical chemical company. And, and what I thought was a very distinctively important part of the, the structure in 3M that worked was the necessity with complex technology-driven approaches to things to have high levels of communication between knowledge workers at all levels. So there wasn't a silo. It was a really flat organization. There were, there were marketing silos in terms of who you sold types of products to, but the technology base and the sharing of technology and manufacturing was company-wide. And the intent was to take a new innovation in part A and spread it quickly to six other areas that could apply it constructively. And in order for that flow of information between the technical employees and the innovators to occur, they had a hundred years of working to create a permissive culture where employees had a percentage of time to work on their own ideas and their management were not allowed to tamper with them. And you know, more damaging to criticize a mistake than to let a mistake happen. It's a learn, learning opportunity. There's all kinds of aphorisms that were an intrinsic part of the culture that were in some ways very much at odds with the Scotch personality in history because they were pretty conservative, but it worked in a kind of weird way. And I came to realize that I was very fortunate to have landed there through the selection process because I would not have lasted at all at most of the other competitive companies where I had interviewed. I just would have not fit in. Mm -hmm. it's How also important was the Minnesota culture and the fact that people trust each other more? Um, that's part of it, I think. It was a, a kind of isolated upper Midwest company. Um, it had its own boundaries because it had a particular heritage bent, um, which had certain conservatism, a total distrust of bankers, always self-funded. I remember McKnight's quote was, I don't want a banker on my board. They'll only give you money when you don't need it and they won't give it to you when you do. So right. I want my own bank here. <laughs> and yeah. that sort of stubborn individualism was part of the culture too. But when you have that as a cultural fit, it creates an expectation of other employees to experience and practice that freedom for themselves and with other people. Yeah. Um, my, my mom is from Minnesota, from rural Minnesota. So I know a bit about the culture there and it, it's, it's quite different. It does shape the way organizations work. Uh, Jerry, a minute ago, you mentioned IBM and Microsoft as places that mm -hmm. may have had some change in culture. Um, I, I don't know that uh, having worked at IBM for almost 10 years and having worked for IB, uh, Microsoft more recently, um, I don't know that they've changed that much. They, they, they started in a better place, I think. And again, at IBM, there was more trust, I think. A lot of people at IBM worked there for 20, 30, even 40 years. Yeah. And there's this connectivity, this, uh, Judy, Judy mentioned the same kind of matrix where people are talking to each other and information is flowing. Um, there wasn't so much paranoia about one division stealing away revenue from another. In contrast, at Microsoft until recently, they had their fiefdoms and people did not talk to each other and they wouldn't trust another division to do something. So they did, everybody did their own thing their own way. Um, the new CEO, I think, has really changed that culture. But that's not fundamental to the culture. I, I, I don't know that they trust so, each other anymore, but there is a sense that you're not going to get money to reinvent somebody, something that somebody else has done already. So well, there's a little bit more. Just as a, for instance, I, just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it, I remembered a sentence I got in the first couple of months I was there. You know, there's a culture at 3M, Judy, that you need to know about. If someone asks you for help, you are required to help them, first of all. And if you can't help them, you're required to find someone else who can. Wow. That's that, awesome. That's just an expectation and you will get verbally slapped down if you don't do that. If you say, I don't have time or I don't know or I can't do something, that's just not allowed. Um, and to get that walk really yeah. is really powerful. That's much better than those carefully crafted mission statements that everybody had, even Enron has. 
exactly. Um, two things. Uh, my Zoom seems to have hung where I can't stop sharing, which seems appropriate given you know the spirit of the call. <laughs> Um, so I, I can still move around the brain and I can still do stuff, but when I hit stop share, it does not undo the screen share. Sorry about that. I might have to drop off the call and come back in if I can. And then I wanted to tell a little bit the story of, of Bob LeBlanc, whom I interviewed a very, very long time ago, like around the year 2000, 2001. Uh, he was a senior executive. He was one of the people like John Patrick and a couple others who um, identified open source software as really important. And before this period, um, IBM is the FUD company, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They have uh, a contention management is their management style. They create completely intentionally competing teams and they force them to batter each other and keep secrets and undermine each other just because they want the, the best thing to win. They have five platforms, none of which talk to each other. Uh, and they've spent a lot of money in 10 years trying to get those platforms to talk to each other to shorten the story a little bit. Um, John Patrick and a few other people say, hey, people, we should go look at Apache and then Linux and then a couple of other things. They adopt these things and begin contributing their patents to open source. I won't say that they're perfect open source players, but there was a sea change of culture at IBM that I saw from the outside at that, in that era at that time. And it, it, like the company went through a near-death experience because people like me, I was a tech industry analyst, we were pretty sure IBM wasn't going to be around in five years because Sun Microsystems, Apollo, and a bunch of others were busy selling cheap, fast servers that were running Unix um, and killing IBM you know, all over the place. Um, and, and so I saw IBM change dramatically. Now, I don't know much about Satya Nadella, but I do know that Microsoft is somehow a very different company today than it was two years ago. Like, like some, something he's done has been profound in the spirit of Microsoft, the people I talk to sound different, feel different, and I, I'm shocked at how profound corporate cultures are over time. Like, like in different eras for different companies, you can tell, oh my God, this person comes from digital equipment, or this is a Kodak person, or whatever. You could just, like Xerox, they, each of these had like this, this ethos that was pushed pretty hard, as it sounds like 3M was for you, Judy, um, where there's certain stories they tell about the culture, um, a, a series of other things that, that happen, but these things degrade or migrate or break or maybe sometimes get stronger over time. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I think what happened with uh, at Microsoft is they put an engineer's engineer in charge, laid out a very clear vision of where the company was going. And he made clear that all the talk about breaking down silos was now reality. And he put some incentives in place. I, I, I guess, I don't know if that's changing the culture or not. I think it's just changing the incentive structure. If everybody knows there's a vision, they'll figure out how to be part of that vision. And if everybody knows they're gonna be penalized if they don't work across boundaries, they'll move. But I, 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 I I don't know. I, I still know a lot of people at, at Microsoft and I, I don't know that, um, I think they're all very excited about the vision. And I think there is mm -hmm. work that wasn't there before. But I, but I, I also, I, and another point I was gonna make is here in Washington, we have a lot of defense contractors and we have a lot of other tech companies where a lot of the key executives come out of the military. And that imposes a particular culture and tends to reinforce hierarchy and need to know kind of thinking. Exactly. Although, um, strangely, I've, I've had a lot of good encounters in the military and intelligence complex where I've been highly impressed by some of the people and some of the sharing capacity in there. I mean, there was a period in the early days of wikis and all that where um, uh, they were really trying hard to share information more than they could. This all turns into, um, whatchamacallit, the... Uh, uh, nicer net. Nope, I'm, I'm not spelling it. Man, I'm not remembering any of the, any of the chains back into it. Basically the leaks, the, the WikiLeaks and other kinds of things that um, came out uh, showing all of the different, uh, all the different problems that were out there. Yeah. Who am I thinking of? Apologies, I need to leave the call, but I appreciate the conversation a lot. Thank you very much. I need to leave Thank too. So. Yep. Thanks Good a discussion. lot. Great.
So Jerry, just getting back to uh, a big uh, question that came up a while ago, which is if I were the CEO, the, the problem is I, I don't know that individuals in the system that we have right now could do much. Uh, certainly I'd like a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, Jerry, I see you back now. I see your video. Um, but to do something and do something good, like, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff that's being done by Howard Schultz that I admire. Um, but the problem is the market will punish you if you do two things that are too bold or too different or not to optimize shareholder value. Right. And um, so what I, what we have to do is perhaps look at leveling that playing field by saying, what is, what are the rules that need to be applied to all corporations that would make it very difficult for the market to, to punish anybody who does something, say uh, raising the workers pay at McDonald's to $15 an hour. You know, if they were to do that, you can imagine that their prices, their stock price would go down quite a bit. Uh, and so what are we going to do to cause them to uh, be able to do those things uh, with more freedom of, of that? And then the other thing I, I've been reading about is the financialization of how corporations operate. A lot of companies, whether you're p g or Coca-Cola or McDonald's, on your balance sheet, you'll notice a lot of income comes from investment in other companies. They're playing the stock market. Now, a lot of companies are so cash rich, they're trying to figure out what to do with that money. And mm -hmm. taxing the income that comes from invested funds versus money that's put back into your own company could be an interesting thing. Or how, what kind of tax breaks could you give them by instead of throwing that into the marketplace to make more income for the shareholders, you are investing in either R&D or in employees or in whatever it is that you need to do. You know, but my overall point is simply this. Individual players are going to have a really hard time making headway and making the right decisions embedded in the system that we have now. Um, I was trying to find the long-term stock exchange while you were talking because I wanted to put it under long-term thinking and it wasn't there apparently. But Eric Reese and others are trying to create a market that doesn't reward short-term gain. Um, don't know how much, how much success they're having or what kind of liftoff they have. I haven't heard about LTSC for a while. Yeah, I can't remember his name. There's somebody in the Washington, D.C. area that was trying to come up with a metric for investment agencies and investment companies based on how sustainable a company is behaving uh, so that they can build that into their long-term projections. What was the uh, adjective? Sustainable. Sustainable, okay. Yeah, oh. and within sustainable, he had several different categories, of environmental sustainability, community sustainability. Um, and he was doing it on an industry-wide basis and basically trying to help you uh, look at how a company is doing relative to its competitors in each of those metrics. I'm realizing that I was just thinking of something that I thought was um, a company thing, but it's actually a country score. But Sam and Anholt and some other people have created something called the good country, which you can join. Uh, and it's $5 a year, basically, as membership. <clears throat> and the idea is they're rating countries through the good country index uh, to show uh, which countries are doing the best for their citizens and the earth, uh, you know, are contributing the most good to the world and which ones are not. Uh, as a way of externalizing or making visible some of the stats, some of the, the progress or lack thereof that's happening. And I, I don't know how effective these things are, but April and I are both uh, good country citizens, so to speak. There are investment funds with the word sustainability in them the Global Sustainability Index Fund and um, various ways to evaluate whether companies are good for the planet. Yep, here's a bunch of them. Yep. Uh, then there's sustainable investment ratings. Uh, all of which under, and, and so part of what happens is, um, I'll go back to one of my favorite uh, op-eds um, this sort of, sort of predates Anand Giridharadas uh, and winners take all, uh, kind of taking over the conversation now. But Peter Buffett, son of Warren Buffett, wrote this really nice op-ed in 2013 called The Charitable Industrial Complex. Yeah. That I've pointed to a bunch. And he shook things up and made a lot of enemies among philanthropists and others. But he said, look, 
when I was young, my father didn't give us a lot of money, but then he gave us a, a big hunk of change at some point. And, and that changed our role in the world of philanthropy. So we started getting invited to things that we weren't invited to before. And I began to realize that of the people sitting in the room, sometimes like the, the right hand was trying to fix something the left hand had broken that mostly the corporations were engaging in behaviors that were requiring nonprofits and others and government agencies to pick up the ball and fix stuff. And if we fixed what companies do in the first place, um, we might not need half of the nonprofit complex. So here's, here's the quote, all are searching for answers with their right hand to problems that others in the room have created with their left. Right? And uh, one of my little sayings uh, from this is philanthropy is not a karmic cleanser that a lot of corporate executives see their social responsible investing arm or their CSR or their philanthropy, their, their foundation as the answer, right? We're, we're just going to do well by taking some of our money and putting it over there and trying to fund something good. I don't, I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. Uh, which then, because we're inside Jerry's brain right now, a, a brief 30 second distraction um, just to entertain you. Uh, prizes created to improve legacies, right? Uh, what did Alfred Nobel invent? Dynamite. Gunpowder. Dynamite. Dynamite. Yeah. Exactly. What uh, did the Joseph Pulitzer basically sort of co-invent alongside William Randolph Hearst? Yellow, Yellow journalism. journalism. Yellow journalism, exactly. And then here's Yellow Journalist. Here's Yellow Journalist Pulitzer, created the top prize in journalism. Uh, and then what was Cecil B. Rhodes all over? Diamonds in Rhodesia. He was an imperialist. He created the Rhodes Scholarships to make sure that the British Empire would last forever and the sun would indeed never set on the British Empire. Um, so this is historically what, what, comp what wealthy individuals do uh, to clean their reputations. I think it's almost fitting that we've ended up here at, uh, at this point in the conversation. But... Uh, Back to you guys. Jerry, are you? I'm still just seeing this old screen. I don't know if you're, if you're. Oh, so you're not seeing, not. you're not seeing anything I've moved or changed. I'm seeing from need to know to need to share at 2.56 okay. PM. I don't know about anybody else. Are you? I'm um, stuck too. Thing? Right there. Oh, my apologies. So I thought that you guys were still seeing me move around because I have shown like 50 things since then. Oh. Um, I don't know if I drop off the call, whether it kills the call. Um, it would it may may not I may be able to get out without doing that but I can't seem to regain control of zoom so I'll probably have to crash Zoom. why Can don't you I make someone else the host momentarily is that possible I can't the controls are not giving me any feedback so I've, I've basically lost control of zoom the pump won't work because the vandal stole the handle okay exactly so why don't I crash my zoom restart it and come back into the room if you guys will stay or try to get back in uh, it should work so okay. let me let me go out and crash zoom before before you sign off i wanted to point out that i posted a great cartoon of how different it companies are organized oh sure fabulous <laughs> it's a beautiful example of how culture defines structure defines behavior thank you so let me crash it and come back in and see if that works So Mike, it's been a long time since I've seen you. What are you up to these days? Well, I've been living in Cyprus for nine months. So I was 10 hours, 10 time zones away from Jerry's brain, which made it very hard for me to join. Uh -huh. But I'm still with Cloudflare and uh, still trying to save the future. All right, should have done that a long time ago. But, but actually I'm also, I just come back and I'm, redefining my role at Cloudflare. So I'm also looking at other opportunities that might be even more exciting. I, I, selfishly, I, I've had seven dream jobs and I'm always looking for the eighth one. Oh, wow. So if you have ideas for a digital technology expert who's also very concerned about shaping the future, let me know. Well, we will do. Well, since uh, I, it's been a while since yes. I've been joining these meetings and I've, uh, myself, I've moved. I'm now living in Denver. And enjoying life, I imagine. Quite a bit. It's beautiful out here. We're having a windstorm today and it's, it's rather nice to be inside a warm building while it's blustery outside with all that snow. Mm. 
You're in Denver itself. You're not up in the mountains on the foot in the in the foothills. Uh, good question. I say Denver, but it's really in one of the suburbs. Yeah. Okay. Very track. Yeah, I'm back, and my brain is now sluggish. So I don't know. I'm gonna have to reboot when we're done with this call. But I'm I'm glad to be back. But at least it we looks like your the lips moving. We haven't seen your lips move for 20 minutes. <laughs> Damn it! Your brain is oh, sluggish. Sorry. But we've heard you speak, which is kind of weird. Well, I know yeah. it's important. The audio is more important. Tell April we miss her, by the way. We'll do. Well, she's apparently in a noisy place right now, a cafe or something, so can't really jump in easily. Is she in Davos this year? No, no, no. We did, we're not. Uh, neither of us went this year. Um, and, and sort of not that eager to go back at some point. So, Well, Cloudflare went in force. We have about 15 people there, and we rented a house. There's actually the Cloudflare house. Oh, cool. So, I guess that's what, when people start asking if you're going to go IPO, you go to Davos and start talking to people who want to help you go IPO. I don't. Makes sense. Does anyone know if Polo is there again this year? If who is? Polo, the company that put out Polo Chain. If they're going to Davos? Yeah, they were there last year. I don't know. No idea. Haven't heard uh, any piece of that. How do you spell the name of the company? Uh, Holo. H-O-L-O. Holo. Sorry. Okay. Well, it's an interesting year for them. They, it's, they're, they're more the butt of more the focus of a lot of criticism this year, the forum is. Yes. Even more than past years. Well, their inability to address all the issues that they, they had a really interesting risk report that came out every year. That's one of my favorite outputs from them. What do they see as the global risk yeah. uh, that are coming out? And I haven't really noticed that it caused any change of action. You know, what are they doing? Uh, with clearly the rich poor divide and inequality, uh, we were talking about Oxfam earlier being one of the things that's yeah. uh, in one way or another driving the whole authoritarianism movement and the populism movement around the world. I think it's a great business model myself. I, I was lucky enough to go three times when I was at the White House and um, it gets all these rich people to pay outrageous amounts just so they can show up in Davos for two or three days and rub elbows and think great thoughts. And they are great thoughts. Yeah. But the rest of the year, the forum is producing some really interesting thought pieces and sometimes doing really good data on competitiveness, on corruption. I mean, they, they have really got the discussion going on some of these big topics. Uh, a lot of focus on sustainability, the digital economy, cybersecurity. So, you know, if, if you if you get the money from the party and you use it to good cause, great. I mean, I I I, I try to follow their reports pretty religiously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at I mean, Jerry. Yeah, you're 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 a reader as well. I see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's the one that people are pointing to these days. Their recent future of jobs report is getting some some press and some attention. Yeah. Does it go into um, UBI and that type of thing? I do not know on this one. I, ha I haven't, because they're in my brain does not mean I've read all these reports. And uh, this one seems like it's more about which jobs might be safe from automation, things of like that. I don't know if this is going into how are people going to stay alive if they don't have a job. Yeah, I've got a report somewhere that I think like three or four years ago came out, a couple of economists looked at all the Bureau of Labor Statistics job descriptions, and they calculated based on things like uh, artificial intelligence and automation and cloud computing, uh, robotics, et cetera, which jobs they thought would be the ones most endangered. Um, and they kind of ranked them all. Yeah. So interesting. I'd like to see if somebody's gone a little bit deeper into that since then. But the issue is, you know, okay, what are you going to do about that? And that's why I'm wondering if they're going into a solution such as UBI or other potential solutions. Which kind of mm -hmm. gets back to what our topic was about, right? If we were running companies, what would we be doing? Yes. And it's the distribution of the monies that come into the company would be an interesting topic. How do you, you know, the part of the conscious capitalism folks, and we're talking about having a 200 to one maximum for pay differential within a company. Uh, but also, how do you pay for, um, what is your responsibility to the communities you, you operate in? Unilever is doing some interesting things. Other companies are doing some interesting things. But these are all 
by choice? How do we help to the, the change the system so that as the company thrives, all the constituencies thrive at the same time? Well, to be radical, isn't the answer some kind of universal employee ownership? I mean, just to mm -hmm. really build a tax structure that rewards corporations that give their people shares. Uh, you know, it, you're not going to fix this problem by redistributing income and by taxing the wealthiest and giving it to the mm -hmm. poorest. You're going to fix this by paying people at the bottom more and government through the tax structure can help. There's a lot of things that can be done that would push companies to behave in a more equitable way. Um, so Paul Pullman, who is now exiting Unilever, was trying to make Unilever a for-benefit corporation um, with no success in, in, in his long run. And I think, Tom, that goes to what you were saying, is that sometimes this, these changes just don't stick. They, you know, they, there's not, they, they don't have the oomph to actually make the change happen, which is too bad because a company the size of Unilever doing that would have been a, a big deal. And, a, and, a made, and who pushed back? Pardon? I assume the board and the major shareholders, right? I'm assuming, yeah, I don't, you know, don't have any inside stories on that. Um, but there are some people out there trying to, trying to do these kinds of things, which is great. But at the end of the day, since Milton Friedman rules and it's all about shareholder value, you have to have an incentive that pushes the company to do the right thing. And that's almost certainly tax code. And, you know, maybe even, you know, companies announcing that they're only going to buy from benefit corporations or they're, they're going to, you know, when they're doing a procurement, they're going to be willing to pay 10% more if it's to a company that treats their employees in an equitable way because they make a value judgment and, and have concluded that companies that do that are more ethical in their business practices or some, you know, there's got to be some, some way to say, we're going to spend a little bit more, we're going to distribute the money a little bit differently because we can make more money that way. In the mm -hmm. long term. And we'll so, a long time of this that's missing, of course. Have any of you seen any data on just a, the very big question of do we need shareholders anymore? When you have a lot of cash rich companies, when you see a lot of Silicon Valley startups saying we, we actually don't want DC money, you know, they're, they're in getting financing in a lot of, in so many different places now. Uh, I, I don't know what the role of an established large corporation, I, I didn't, just because I'm not a financial person, I don't know, maybe there's a huge role for them. Um, I know that large corporations make money just by investing that extra cash flow that they have. But that's not necessarily um, creating wealth for the, for the community. I mean, they're not, they're not doing what they're paid together to do, like making products, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wondered if we had some way of ratcheting down the, the leverage that finance had in the whole system. So in, in 2015, happening? April and I were at a conference in Reykjavik uh, named Point Zero. One of the other speakers was this guy, Simon Dixon, <clears throat> who did a talk about cryptocurrencies before cryptocurrencies had their big boom. Um, but he did a really interesting thing was he took the usual funding stages model for a startup, which is your own pocket, friends, fools, family, seed round, you know, A round, B round, C round, all the way to debt. And then he started showing how crowdfunding and other kinds of sourcing were starting to eat those things systematically one after the other. And, and how you might actually be able to self-fund through the pretty high stages of capital coming in without going through the usual intermediaries, the usual operatives who then would seek to control your company or, or whatever else. It was, it was pretty, really pretty interesting. Um, also, just kind of to take our conversation um, around full circle to where it started because we're getting close to our end here. Um, Anand Giridharadas is kind of uh, one of our heroes in the household these days. And uh, starting with the talk he did at the Aspen uh, Ideas Festival way back when, but a bunch of other things. And now he has a, a, a new bestseller called Winners Take All. I'll get to that in a second. But he had a, he was on an interview with Paul Pullman. Uh, who I, I just sort of said I'm kind of a fan of, but they were sitting there and he said, well, you wanna do something good for the world? Tell you what, why don't you pull this product from India? And he basically, I think he pulled out a, a tube or a, a dispenser of fair and lovely fairness cream. And do you guys know what fairness creams are? 
Light, skin lighteners? Skin lighteners, because in India, lighter is better. And uh, there's a very big business selling uh, people something to, um, to lighten their skin color. And Pullman basically ducked and dodged and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't say, of course we'll pull this, you know, it's, it's stupid that we're selling something that, that reinforces this stupid prejudice. But that's the kind of thing that would be pretty interesting, right? Yeah. I know we only have five minutes left, Jerry, but we haven't talked much about the digital CEO, digital industry CEOs. And I mean, maybe it's because we've already talked enough about Zuckerberg and the, the debate, but clearly we have a trust problem right now. And the tech lash is getting so extreme that it's really gonna hurt the development of the next generation of digital companies. Well, it's, it's the whole, thank you for bringing this up. I, I appreciate it, Mike. Um, Tech That's impressive, really Jerry. TechLash has, what, 57 different connections? Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so part of what I, th I mean, part of what happened was a bunch of us, probably me included, thought, hey, if we connect everybody so that at zero marginal cost, they can actually share ideas, good things will happen. We ignored the fact that the way anybody was funding this was a business model that meant they were busy scooping up our data exhaust and selling it to, to the you know, first comers, and that they would then combine, recombine, and improve this data so that they got pretty good at it. Uh, and that, that data then got pretty valuable. Um, and then we wondered later why everybody got addicted and was having nonsense conversations around cute cat pictures instead of fixing the problems of society, voting better, uh, getting to know each other better, the kinds of stuff that those of us who are optimists about this were hoping would happen. And so I think one of the big issues, one of the big things that, that could happen would be uh, some of these companies deciding that it's not in their best interest to get us all addicted. And, and here, I think Google is less guilty than Facebook by far. I mean, Facebook is all, you know, Google, uh, there's, there's a whole separate conversation about what motivates whom. And, you know, Apple can take some moral high ground here, partly because, you know, Apple World and a bunch of other things died off. They don't have... Uh, you know, Apple Link, Apple World, a whole bunch of Apple ventures to try to do these sorts of things just died on the vine. So, hey, they've got a retail business where they get paid up front. Uh, so they have, in some sense, the luxury of saying we don't really do this. Um, so uh, why don't we use the last couple of minutes um, for um, what you guys think about the tech clash? I agree with your ranking, you know, Facebook being the bad actor, Google being suspect, Amazon probably being about the same level, and then Apple taking, you know, not uh, on the scale of, you know, good to bad or, you know, or good to evil, you know, Apple seems to, and Salesforce, which is an enterprise for the most part, I, I think they're really well positioned. Um, mm -hmm. Benioff has been saying a lot of very reasonable, important things. Anybody else? That if you look at you know the, the migration of those companies to the top of the Fortune 500, you know the whether they're what do you call it? They're the information economy or they're the platform companies. These their business model has proven to be the ones that have been by far the most successful successful in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk to you know we have this ability to do micro payments on things. You can't remember what it was. I was talking to Alexa and I said. Hey Alexa, we'll play some ambient sound. Uh, she's she's uh, starting up right responding now. Responding now, yeah. Yes. Um, but then she came back and said, "Oh, by the way, for an extra eighty-three cents, you can get the premium sound." And so, what I was thinking is, "Wow, what if, what what if there is a way? I mean, obviously, there's a way to measure the data flow from me to those companies, mm -hmm. right? And micro payments going the other way." Um, I'm a contributor. I'm, a, I'm an OEM to them, right? I'm, I'm a provider of, a, of raw material. Uh, I'm just wondering, we just haven't looked at how do you tax in information or control information flow? Alexa, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a content pr providing slave. Exactly. Yeah. Karen Lanier. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Who Owns the Future is an interesting book about, on that. And, you know, he, he actually has a very simple solution, right? You don't pay for the damn thing. You know, mm -hmm. having all these free services. 
And what's interesting is um, it, it, you can't buy your way off of uh, into a, a non stocky version of Facebook because if Facebook offered that, uh, only the people who could afford it would do it and it would create this adverse selection problem with their ad pool, right? There was okay. an amazing article that I put on Facebook today on a guy who tried to avoid Amazon. He, he was going to try to avoid all the big players, but he, it's entitled, I tried to block Amazon from my life and I'll post the link right now. Thanks. He actually built a, a tool that would check every time he was touching some service that was running on the Amazon cloud or oh or wow to buy something. So he was trying to avoid the whole thing. Oh, total. Yeah, it did not wow. work. Wow. Hmm. Thank you. Hey, Benioff made the news three hours ago saying his industry is to blame for rampant inequality. I wonder if he said that while he was at Davos. <laughs> Almost certainly certain he did. He said yeah. on the Davos. Peter Schwartz. Well, Peter's one of my, actually, Peter is there, I know. He's one of my heroes. Every, everyone knows Peter Schwartz, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the class on the future I teach is uh, built around his book, The Art of the Long View. Cool. Jerry, I'm so cool. glad I could join a full session. I typically was, you know, tuning in at, 11.30 at night in Cyprus and catching a little bit of what you guys were doing, but this is much better. And I was pulling- That's great. Thank you. thank you for letting Lizzie crash the party. She wanted to say hello I to you. I was going to say thank, thank you for bringing Lizzie in. She great. was great, as usual. You haven't seen her in uh, probably four years, so. Well, no, you guys came through Portland. We had dinner together. Oh, that's right. Yeah, of course, in person. But the- as in, 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 human, in human presence, like it wasn't an avatar. It was like- at least for all intents and purposes, I was well fooled that you were actually, you know, sitting right there. Because we were drinking a beer. This was right exactly. after the solar eclipse. And it was not a pour through. Yes, I had just come back from, from watching the eclipse with uh, yeah. Charles. Cool. Well, okay. thank you very much. Totally appreciate this. Um, I think there's lots of earth to turn on this topic. So maybe may revisit it in a different structured way. If if a structure occurs to you that would be really fruitful, send me an email or post it on the Inside Jerry's Brain List or something like that, and we'll, we'll structure around that. Great. But, uh, all right. For now. Thank you all. Thanks much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.